This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund. Well, of course you know Michael Hiblin, the news director of KUAR, Public Radio for Central Arkansas. And he's hardly a stranger to the AETN television audience, being a frequent panelist on Arkansas Week. But you're forgiven for not knowing that Michael Hiblin is one of those railroad freaks. Those men and women, and some boys and girls, who find romance in the rails, who hear symphonies in the roar of the locomotive, in the shrill of the whistle, and one railroad in particular, the Rock Island. Michael's new book, The Rock Island in Arkansas, is at once a celebration and a lament, and author, author, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. When did this love affair of yours begin? Really, it was uh, second grade. I grew up in North Little Rock, and at that time, every third year for school, because of the ongoing desegregation efforts, you'd be bused to a different part of town. And for second grade in the fall of 1979, I was bused to Redwood Elementary. It's about two blocks off of Broadway. And directly in front of the school <laughs> was the busy main line for the Rock Island Railroad. And I loved trains at the time, wasn't familiar with the Rock Island up until that point. But I enjoyed uh, watching trains when I was at school, out at recess. I'd Hear the trains go by, sometimes even in my classes, teachers during art or whatnot would let me go over to the window and watch trains. I didn't know it at the time, but it was a time when the Rock Island was really struggling. And the following March in 1980, the Rock Island was shut down. And it really struck a chord with me. And it's what started me wanting to learn more about what happened. So by high school, 11th grade English class, you had to write a research paper. They wanted you to do something original. And I thought, well, let me find out what happened to the Rock Island Railroad. Yeah. And that's when I started what's really been uh, 30 years of on again, off again research. I interviewed my first former uh, Rock Island employee at that time, uh, went over to the Arkansas Gazette, got a lot of information uh, through their clip files and whatnot. And uh, it's been a passion of mine that I've kind of looked into over the years. Michael, well, and we'll pause for a moment to note that growing up as you did in North Little Rock, North Little Rock was not exclusively a railroad town, but the railroads were integral to uh, to North Little Rock. They were they were as much North Little Rock, say, as the Cotton Belt was at Pine Bluff. North Little Rock wasn't the only town that, that had a heavy railroad presence or influence. Right, and it had originally <laughs> been the, uh, the western end for the first railroad in Arkansas, the uh, Memphis and Little Rock. Uh, you also had, uh, by that time, the Missouri Pacific, what's today Union Pacific, has a huge uh, shop over there and uh, yard, and uh, you had three railroads that served North Little Rock. North Little Rock was pretty much uh, created by the railroads. When did it take the Rock Island? What are its roots? The Rock Island uh, expanded into Arkansas uh, in 1902 with a hostile takeover of the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf. It had started, uh, oh, about 30 or 40 years before that in uh, the Chicago area and slowly grew. But in Arkansas, it entered with the uh, acquisition, this hostile takeover of the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf. It was created at the end of the 1800s to connect coal resources with Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, the Mississippi River in particular. And as the Rock Island was growing nationwide, it eyed the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf as a strong railroad. It had just uh, expanded greatly. It had taken over what had been the Memphis and Little Rock. It invested a lot of money in the state. It built the uh, bridge that uh, 
still stands crossing the Arkansas River, what was the Rock Islands Bridge. It's now part of the uh, Clinton Presidential Library. It built the uh, Grand Passenger Station that uh, is today the Clinton School of Public Service. It says the Choctaw Route on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also expanded west and uh, did indeed uh, connect Memphis all the way to Oklahoma. It was part of a time when the Rock Island was expanding aggressively and uh, moved into the state. It acquired parts of what had been 32 different railroads in Arkansas. And uh, at its peak, it had a huge footprint in the state. Yeah, it prospered in it those, did. those early days. It did. And uh, it also had its uh, times of struggling too. Uh, like most railroads, there were times it would enter bankruptcy, <coughs> uh, do a reorganization, and would eventually emerge. That had happened uh, two times uh, early in the uh, 20th century, uh, but in 1975 is when it uh, really hit a time of struggling. And there's a deep uh, history behind that, but uh, it ended up in bankruptcy in 1975 and eventually was shut down in 1980. There, it, it's all what you mentioned, the, the uh, proliferation or the abundance anyway of comparatively small, even tiny railroad companies uh, in Arkansas and other states at the time. It, 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 it makes one think any almost of school districts. You know, every little tiny community had a small school district. A lot of them had their own railroad, basically. Right. At the, uh, when railroads were first being created, oftentimes it would just be a line created to connect two small towns. And people today don't always realize the uh, impact of railroads, and that was really how uh, goods as well as people got around. Back before you had, uh, you know, paved roads or major highways, much less the uh, interstate system that uh, came in in the 1950s. Uh, but it was uh, the key way that people got around toward the uh, end of the 1800s and the first part of the 20th century. Uh, and it was uh, a vital way of uh, getting goods and commerce uh, and people around. Where, where was the focus anyway, the primary focus? Where was the money made? Was it in raw materials, finished products, goods, or passengers? Uh, in Arkansas, it depends what section uh, you're talking about. In South Arkansas, you had timber was key for the Rock Island. El Dorado, when oil was first uh, discovered there in the 1920s, that's when you had, uh, I believe it was about 90% of the oil discovered there was being taken out by the Rock Island. But it was a major uh, passenger railroad line. Its Sunbelt route, which was the uh, main line that went from Memphis to Little Rock and on west into Oklahoma and uh, could then take people uh, down to Amarillo, Texas. They could then uh, get connection service with the Southern Pacific and go all the way to Los Angeles. Uh, it was a major way for people to get around. You also had uh, trains that went directly from Chicago to Hot Springs. Uh, as part of a connection with the uh, Illinois Central, passengers could take uh, nonstop uh, or connecting trains through trains uh, from Chicago in Memphis. It would be picked up by the Rock Island and it would run first class trains all the way into Hot Springs. And that was when Hot Springs was uh, known as a big resort town. You had the uh, the hot springs coming out of the water, and there were, you know, no other for activities. Their, other well. activities, gambling. He had organized crime. You had uh, uh, the mafia people who are, you know, so known now who would travel directly from Chicago, and Hot Springs was another little playground for them. I, I note uh, one of the advertisements that you captured in the book uh, uh, boasted that. One could now travel from Memphis to Amarillo in something like 30 hours. Yeah. And this was an astonishing, uh, and, and then comfort, you know, with dining cars and yeah. multiple meals, snacks, whatever. Well, at that time, when you consider what you uh, did have, otherwise you'd be going in a slow-moving automobile, and uh, at that time, highways weren't fully developed, and uh, you weren't always assured of, uh, you know, service for your vehicle, and uh, so it was considered uh, almost miraculous to be able to travel uh, like that in that time. The Rock Island and other railroads, and to some extent still do, but those, those lines put a lot of food on a lot of families' tables. 
and they made comparatively good living. They uh, did uh, to get on board with the make Rock a career Island. of the railroad. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of times you had uh, several generations within one family that would work for the Rock Island. Uh, some said it was nepotism, but it really was. That's how you would have, uh, you know, several generations. Uh, and if you got on board with the Rock Island, that was uh, a good living because you could build up seniority. Uh, you would have job stability. Uh, and if you, once you started building seniority, you had a, a good uh, uh, income for the rest of your life. You could provide for your family. So it was uh, aggressive to uh, get that opportunity. Not that we don't now, <clears throat> but America and, and the South needed railroads. I mean. Yeah. It, uh, you know, when you look at the ways that people got around at the time, when the Rock Island and its uh, predecessors in Arkansas built those tracks, it enabled people to get around in ways they had never been able to. And that was uh, really key, a lot of people say, to the development of the state. It took a lot of effort at that time to lay the rails because uh, you didn't necessarily have the uh, heavy equipment you do today. You had to actually get a lot of manpower out there to build up the grade and to actually uh, construct the track. It, and that was backbreaking work. That was, that was a feat of engineering in and of itself, particularly when you talk about lying, laying track through the mountainous regions of Arkansas or that spongy soil over in the Delta. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the flat land over there, especially the uh, delta between Brinkley and Memphis, so swampy. It took so much effort to uh, build up that track and to actually uh, get it where the trains could flow on it. That took, uh, you know, it's unfathomable how much effort it actually took and money to uh, lay those rails. And when you had, say, flooding, there were several instances of flooding in the 1920s and 30s and a lot of times the only way to get around was by rail and in fact the Rock Island because highways would be underwater for months at a time the Rock Island even uh, ran shuttle trains where they would let uh, people drive their cars up onto flat cars and the railroads uh, the Push. tracks would still be up yeah. and you have a few pictures of that in the book uh, but the railroads would actually um, then move these uh, passengers through the flooded areas. They could stay in their cars or they could uh, load their cars and then get into the passenger coaches. But it was a key way to get around during times like that. Provided a lot of middle class uh, families with uh, or middle class income and it allowed people to move up uh, in terms of income. But it could also be dangerous work. Railroading wasn't easy work. Yeah, you didn't have uh, block signals come in really until the uh, 1950s. You had a lot of times where you had deadly accidents uh, where someone could just overlook one train on uh, an order slip and then you would have a horrific head-on collision. Unfortunately, it happened uh, a lot in the railroads or just uh, one mistake. Uh, one person I interviewed, uh, a former employee, you know, most employees, if they spent a few decades working for the railroad, had a few close calls and uh, just, uh, you know, just kind of slip, you lose uh, your footing, you could easily uh, fall off a train. All kinds of uh, horrific stories like that. And, uh, or in another instance, uh, there was a guy who I interviewed, uh, his name was Guy Winters, and he told the story of uh, one time he accidentally uh, flushed his locomotive's brakes. And uh, what that basically meant is that the only stopping power he had for this uh, huge uh, freight train was the cars on his, uh, in the back of the train, the uh, uh, freight cars, and he ran through a signal that told him there was going to be a passenger train at the next depot at Ola, Arkansas. And uh, he was not able to uh, stop his train. He came around a corner and uh, was expecting to see a passenger train sitting there. 
and much to his relief, the passenger train he had was just moved He expecting to on. die, it sounds like. He was expecting to die, but he also expected that, worse still, he would be uh, killing a lot of passengers. Yeah. He said over and over, women and children, that's what he was thinking. But fortunately, he came around the corner, the passenger train had just stopped. He had already thrown the train into emergency, but he said he just got off the locomotive and did finally stop and shook for a few minutes. Just said it was just so terrifying for him, the prospect of that one mistake that he made and the impacts that could have happened. I heard so many stories like that in the employee interviews that I recorded over the years. You mentioned Ola, uh, and you have a route map of uh, the Rock Island in the book. But it seems so many small towns, communities, there was a, there was a depot there. That Rock was yeah. that station house. Yeah, and those depots would be the center of the community. And if you go through where you still have the uh, old Rock Island depots standing today, uh, Carlisle, Hazen, Lone Oak, Brinkley, uh, those were the centers of the towns, and they were sort of the lifeblood to the outside world. That's where uh, people kind of went out to the depot to, you know get the mail <laughs> first off yeah. uh, or to just to, to feel a connection with the outside world. Back in the days before you had uh, broadcasting or other ways to get around or the telephone even, the depot was where uh, people arrived. And every town at that time, railroads needed uh, to service the uh, engines, the locomotives uh, regularly, especially in the steam days. And every town they would get to uh, would have another depot, and that's where they'd uh, get servicing. Passengers would get on, get off uh, mail. That was a key way that uh, mail was distributed around the country for the uh, postal service. You mentioned the engineer who got lucky that day at Ola. Uh, when you are interviewing these veterans of the Rock Island and other railroads too, did they, <clears throat> did they have something in common, a sense of their own romance, a sense of history that they had participated in? Did they share that with you in any way? Could you detect that in there? Some did. It was interesting because some clearly did appreciate uh, railroads. I was actually surprised how many employees, because I was primarily seeking uh, photos for this book, I was surprised how many never took a single photograph. You know, they some looked at it as this is going to work, didn't see it yeah. maybe necessarily as history, but you quickly learn, you spend a few decades, you see the changes and how railroads, like uh, most other industries, are constantly evolving. Uh, but some did have a, a great appreciation for that, just depended on the uh, particular employee. Sure, I, I guess I was wondering whether for many of them it was a labor of love as well as a labor for the family. I mean, it just yeah. means sustenance. It was indeed a, a labor of love. And what struck me, and I dedicated the book to the uh, employees who kept the railroad running through great adversity until it was finally shut down, it really was uh, a family camaraderie, especially on the Rock Island. Uh, after the railroad was shut down, uh, I talked to employees who then went to work for different railroads and really learned what a family operation the Rock Island was, how employees really did look out for one another in ways even beyond at other railroads uh, and sometimes protected employees, you know, when mistakes happened. Uh, in the instance of the story at Ola, yeah, there was no official report made about that because uh, you know, they got lucky. I mean, nothing they happened. got lucky, yeah. so no reason to bring in the Interstate Commerce Commission. Well, you mentioned the <clears throat> ICC no longer extant, but what happened to the Rock Island? It it took decades for it to die, but it. Yeah, it was a struggling era for railroads after World War II. World War II was the uh, railroads were the main way that uh, you got troops out, and. Uh, in a lot of places, like for instance, the Little Rock train station, that's where uh, troops would depart and uh, head over for World War II. It's where they would see their families and in some cases see their families <coughs> for the last time. Or if they made it back from the war, it's where uh, families would greet their relatives. Um, it, the depots were just, if you can imagine, sometimes they seem like old buildings now, but the people who came through there, the things that 
happened in these depots are really amazing, or in some cases, if they were killed in service. Uh, I've heard many stories that the Little Rock train station is where the families would come to claim the body. Uh, but after World War II, you had the uh, growth of the interstate system. Uh, Eisenhower really pushed for uh, the interstate system to be built, and uh, that took a lot of passengers off of uh, the railroad trains. You also had uh, a lot of trucks start being moved more and more on the interstate system. The interstates were uh, federally subsidized, and that also worked against railroads. So it was a time when railroads began struggling, and uh, you had railroads looking for ways to cut expenses and find a way to survive. The beginning of the end, really, for the Rock Island came in 1964. A plan was devised for Rock Island to merge with Union Pacific. Today you have Union Pacific in Arkansas, but at that time it was not. That time it was uh, Missouri Pacific, and that's who Union Pacific ended up acquiring in the 1980s. In uh, 1964, Union Pacific and Rock Island proposed a merger plan, and uh, the southern division that included Arkansas would go to the uh, southern Pacific, and uh, it began what is said to have been the longest most complicated merger case ever considered by the Interstate Commerce Commission. You had a lot of other railroads opposed to this, said it would create an unfair uh, competition environment with uh, just this giant railroad, and a lot of them uh, fought the railroad. The Rock Island at that time stopped doing infrastructure, and it's uh, mainly its track. The track really went downhill. The equipment uh, really wasn't being maintained very well and you started getting uh, slow orders out on the line. Even the main line, what had once run uh, grand passenger trains, the Choctaw Rocket, which ran, uh, you know, some employees said they would run it up to 90 miles an hour. The track got to be in such poor shape that uh, trains were limited in some areas to 10 miles per hour. You started having uh, derailments constantly. Uh, and everything went downhill for the Rock Island and by the time the approval, the merger, was given the approval by the ICC, the Union Pacific backed away, said it would cost too much money for us to upgrade this now and uh, we don't want it, and just walked away from the deal. And the Rock Island almost immediately filed for bankruptcy in 1975, attempted a reorganization. They got some uh, federal subsidies to reopen a car shop at Biddle Yard, the main yard in, in uh, Little Rock, but uh, there was a uh, creditor, one creditor in particular, a guy named Henry Crown, who said that the Rock Island was worth more dead than alive. And during this reorganization, he uh, continually pushed for the Rock Island to be shut down and liquidated. You then had a, a strike that occurred in 1979. Kind of a complicated matter. Some of it goes to uh, federal union politics. You had a union leader who had just lost a, a major strike on another railroad where uh, the railroad management said, okay, we'll continue running trains uh, without the employees and effectively did. And then when the Rock Island was due back wages, ended up putting a fight and uh, Rock Island employees ended up going on strike. And that was really the uh, final nail in the coffin for the Rock Island. Uh, you had management that attempted to keep trains running, but uh, you had this uh, creditor again pushing for the uh, railroad to be liquidated and uh, said that this strike was just another example of uh, problems within the railroad. I should also back up and say there had been arguments up until this point that there was too much redundancy among railroads in the United States. Too many cons uh, communities were served by different railroads that we needed to thin down the number of railroads operating and that would make railroads overall more profitable in the U.S. It was also just a time when railroads in general were struggling. Uh, but in uh, March of 1980, uh, a judge had ordered the Rock Island be liquidated. The issue came, the order came down, I believe, in January of 1980, and they began embargoing uh, cars and moving them to central locations. And in March of 1980, that's when you did finally have the uh, Rock Island shut down. And to 
back up to the beginning of our conversation. That was when me as a second grader, I noticed <laughs> the train stop going by in front of my school. Uh, the Cotton Belt acquired uh, uh, the Rock Island, operated it for 90 days, but uh, then after that, the uh, rail road in Arkansas, except for a few isolated spots that were picked up by other lines, for the most part, uh, were abandoned. It was you as a second grader who got into it. It was a first-term governor who, who had uh, tried to play a role, tried, tried to make tried to rescue, in effect, the Rock Island, keep or some of the jobs, anyway, up in like that. His yep. name was Bill Clinton. Yep, Governor Clinton serving his uh, first term in office between 1979, or 1978 and 1980. And this was a huge crisis for Arkansas. At that time, the Rock Island had about 800 employees in the state who would be losing their jobs. Good jobs. Good jobs. And you also had a lot of communities that were very concerned about this. You had places like uh, uh, Boonville uh, and others that didn't have servicing by another railroad, had commodities that had to uh, get in and out. In the case of Boonville, they had a couple of factories along the Rock Island. And I went through uh, the files of Governor Clinton. Uh, they're kept at the Butler Center, largely unprocessed, but uh, uh, I was able to uh, go through a file that, uh, really a box load of papers that were uh, maintained by the governor's office and they included uh, letters and the governor's replies uh, from people concerned about it or other railroads saying, you know, you shouldn't, you know, if you want a railroad, you know, infrastructure in this state, you need to go ahead and let this in. Uh, but the governor's office was very concerned about this and there were a lot of plans uh, floated. There were efforts to try and get other railroads to come in and acquire what had been the Rock Island tracks in the state. There were issues with the uh, union's obligations that scared off other railroads, and uh, in the end, you didn't have any other railroads come in because they might have to uh, hire Rock Island employees, they might have to pay back wages, a whole host of other factors. Then you had a plan presented. It was uh, one lawmaker in particular, Lloyd George of Danville, one of these uh, rail lines that was served by the Rock Island, and uh, he proposed the state by the track. This had happened in uh, other states, and then the state would uh, lease them out to other railroads. That uh, was uh, didn't last in the legislature, and eventually the railroads were pretty much sold for scrap. The rails picked up and just sold for the raw steel. Well, we don't have the Rock Island, but we have the memories in your book. Michael Hiblin, thanks very much for the book. Thank and you. And for your time. Thanks. Michael Hiblin, the Rock Island Railroad in Arkansas. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.